let's uh, start with uh, lecture by uh, Carlos. Okay. Okay, so yesterday, let me remind you some of the things we said about uh, QCD. So we said that uh, QCD, uh, the Lagrangian, depends on a dimensionless constant. Right? The Jan Mills coupling. And then uh, if you look at the uh, quantum corrections, then this uh, actually is renormalized and it becomes dependent on the renormalization scale. So it has some um, logarithmic dependence. Okay, where this uh, B0 is a like coefficient that depends on the number of colors and the number of flavors. And then what happens is that uh, we trade uh, this dimensionless coupling constant by some scale. Uh, you can also write this scale. This will be the one loop result and the scale. You can rewrite it like this. Okay, and then you can see that this is invariant. It doesn't depend on the randomization scale. So at high energies, the theory becomes weakly coupled. And then we have uh, free quarks and gluons. This is asymptotic freedom. And then at low energies, when this randomization scale approaches this uh, lambda QCD scale, the coupling grows. So the theory becomes strongly coupled. And then we cannot apply perturbation theory. And what happens in this strongly coupled regime is that uh, the properties of QCD uh, change uh, radically. So first of all, there is a mass gap at the strong coupling. So even if, the, even if we had massless quarks uh, and massless uh, gluons, at the strong coupling, all the degrees of freedom are gap with masses that are proportional to this uh, scale. There is the phenomenon of confinement. Okay, so this means there are no free asymptotic states of quarks and gluons. So we cannot observe them in experiments of, uh, in colliders, for instance. Another non-perturbative effect that happens at strong coupling is chiral symmetry breaking. Okay, so this means that there is a quark condensate, which is non-zero. Okay, that breaks uh, part of the flavor symmetries spontaneously. Uh, now, if we introduce uh, temperature or chemical potential, we have an effective coupling constant evaluated at these scales. 
right? So for temperatures and chemical potentials much larger than lambda QCD, then the theory becomes weakly coupled again. And then we have free quartz and gluons. Okay, so there should be, as we increase temperature and chemical potential, there should be a transition between this low energy behavior and the behavior that we coupling. So there is some transition, which is a confinement the confinement. as we increase temperature or chemical potential. Okay, so we would like to capture uh, a low temperature or at zero temperature and chemical potential. We would like to capture these properties of uh, QCD. And then we should observe that uh, when we increase this uh, temperature and chemical potential, there is some kind of transition that uh, takes us to a phase, which is not going to be like QCD, because it's going to be strongly coupled in the holographic model. But that is similar to the deconfined phase of uh, QCD with free, with color degrees of freedom instead of uh, confinement. Yes. Maybe, could you comment on, I've heard many times that confinement is not proven in QCD. Could you comment on what does that statement mean in because if we already expect no f asymptotic free states? <laughs> yeah. It's an observational fact, no? That you don't see free quarks and gluons. So, so the statement that it's not proven is... It's just that there is no rigorous mathematical proof oh, of okay. confinement. One of the millennium prizes is yeah. mathematics. Yeah. But there are many. OK. You can show there is confinement in the lattice. If you do a lattice simulation, you can see there is confinement. And then there are a lot of arguments about how is confinement and why you have confinement. Yeah. yeah. Just how do you diagnose that there is confinement? You know, I know that, for instance, if you calculate the expectation value of Wilson loops or something like this, you should be able to uh, see that if there is confinement or not. Is this one of those situations, or I, I'm going to talk about this, okay. the, <laughs> this criterion? Yeah. Okay, but before going into confinement, I'm going to talk about the generation of a mass gap. Okay. So, let's see how we can get a mass gap in holography. Okay, so let's start with the case we know best, which is um, the dual of a CFT. We know that the holographic dual of a CFT in the dimensions is an anti de Sitter, uh, well, a gravitational theory living in anti de Sitter space in one more dimension. So we can write uh, the metric in point carrier coordinates like this, where L is the anti de Sitter radius. Okay, and in this coordinates, the asymptotic boundary is at R going to infinity. So, as you have seen, uh, the radial coordinate is related to the energy scale of the dual field theory. So, R over L squared is, roughly speaking, the energy scale in the CFT. 
right? So the asymptotic boundary corresponds to the ultraviolet. And when R goes to zero, you are going to the infrared. So if we have a mass gap, this means that uh, all the degrees of freedom have an energy which is at least uh, equal to the mass of the lightest uh, state, right? So this means that below this mass, there is nothing. There are no degrees of freedom. And a way to implement uh, this in this kind of setup is just to put uh, a wall in the geometry. So this is called the hard wall. So if we have a mass gap, there are no degrees of freedom for energies below the value of the gap. So this means that there is no geometry. or some value R gap over all square. Uh, for values of uh, the radius below this R gap. Okay. And we identify this with the with the scale of the gap. Now, the picture is like this. Uh, we have a, this will be the radial direction. And here, the radius is going to infinity. So here, we have the CFT, the ultraviolet of the CFT. And then in the interior, we have the ADS space. And at this value, R gap. The geometry ends. So there is some kind of uh, hard wall. Now, in order to see how this is generated in a mass gap, uh, we use the holographic dictionary. Right? So let's do the simple thing, which is in the CFT, we have some scalar operator. O. And then this means in the gravity side, there will be a dual scalar field that depends on the radial coordinate. And then if we apply this scalar operator over the vacuum state, that will produce in general some excited state. Okay, so we can relate uh, these scalar operators to some physical states. that we obtain applying this over the vacuum. Right? So the easiest thing to imagine is if you have a free scalar, right, and you apply it over the vacuum of the focus space, you create a particle. Yes? So what do you mean by uh, uh, ND? Uh, Ending of a space, no, ending of a geometry. I mean, we know that in free ADS that after this, uh, what is called R gap, uh, the space is uh, space time is there. So, what do you mean by a cut off? That there is a serious cut off. There is no space time. So, we are imposing some geometry like uh, similar to black holes or something or something. So, this I means I'm cutting yes. by hand the space and I, I'm yes. putting a boundary there, like. If I take this uh, blackboard and I cut a piece of it, yes. then I create a boundary. Yes, so, so basically, the, uh, physically, if you consider this uh, ADS matrix, so uh, there should be a space after that. So we are 
constructing some different geometry, or uh, just we are putting a uh, hypothetical surface and uh, not considering the space times after that? I don't understand. Yeah, we are doing that. We are just uh, not consider considering anything beyond this. OK. Yeah? So okay. it's like creating a boundary there. I see. OK, fine. Thanks. Yeah. OK. So once we have uh, uh, this, uh, we can relate this physical state that the operator creates to uh, some uh, solutions for the scalar field in the gravity dual, which are the normalizable modes. OK, so these are solutions of the equations of motion of the scalar field that satisfy a condition at the boundary that they are normalizable. OK, and then if uh, this scalar operator has dimension delta, then the scalar field should have a mass, which in units of the anti resistor radius is delta, delta minus. OK, this is the holographic dictionary that you probably saw already. OK, so the we can derive the spectrum of the CF of the dual field theory, which is not a CFT anymore, although asymptotically it is, from uh, the spectrum of normalizable modes. No? So we are interested in finding this spectrum. So the equation of motion of the scalar. is uh, just, uh, we're going to assume this is a free scalar, then it's just the Laplacian in the curve geometry. OK, so this will be the equation where this uh, GMN metric is just the ABS metric. Yes? Uh, yes, it's uh, not working very well, the chalk. Uh, eh? Is this part? If I do it below, it's better. Let me try. Ah, yeah, here is much better. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not uh, translational invariant. <laughs> Ui. Let's, uh, OK. OK, so this is uh, up to here. You can read that. Uh, let's try. Okay, so this is just the Laplacian in curve uh, in a curve background, right? The square root of the determinant of the metric, and these are the derivatives and the inverse of the metric, no? And then there is just the mass term equal to zero. Okay, so it's just the Klein-Gordon equation in curve space-time. Okay, so we can expand in Fourier modes of the directions of the field, the field theory dual. Um. Uh. Let me do it over there.
So Q here is the momentum along the field theory directions. And then there is a factor which is the amplitude of the Fourier mode and the phase, right? Okay, so you can plug uh, this Fourier expansion and solve for each of the modes. That is a simple exercise with this metric, and then the solutions are uh, vessel functions. Okay. In this case, it's maybe simpler to use the, the coordinate inverse to this, but uh, with this definition, maybe it's more clear the connection to the energy scale. Okay, so it's some vessel functions where this uh, index nu is related to the conformal dimension of the dual operator. And this capital M is uh, just uh, the mass, if you want, of the mode. The, ma the mass in the field theory directions. So if we didn't have uh, this, uh, this wall over there, then, uh, well, we will have a continuum a spectrum. So in order to see this, what we need to do is to expand the solutions when R goes to infinity. So this first solution goes like uh, 1 over R to the delta, and the other solution goes like 1 over R to the D minus delta. So this is the normalized. Uh, we're going to assume that the dimension of this operator is uh, such that the dual operator is a uh, relevant operator. So in this case, this means that this is the normalizable mode. Uh, this will be the other one. And this is the non-normalizable. Okay, so if we want to see the spectrum of normalizable modes, we will just uh, set uh, b equals to zero. And then in principle, if there is no wall, then we just have a continuum spectrum. Now, because we have this wall, we need to specify some boundary conditions for the scalars on this boundary. Okay, so there are several possibilities. Uh, the simplest one is just to impose Dirichlet boundary conditions. I mean, changing the boundary conditions doesn't change much. Uh, unless you fine tune them. So people have played with different possibilities, but the first and the most obvious one is to impose uh, boundary conditions. Such that the field vanishes there. So we impose that at R gap, the field is vanishing. So together with the condition that the mode is normalizable, then you see that uh, this gives us uh, the following uh, equation. Okay, and this has solutions only for some discrete set of values of this M. No? So, so 
we need. So this is satisfied when M is the uh, scale, proportional to the scale of the mass gap, times the zero of uh, the vessel function that you know is uh, discrete set. Okay, so this means we have a discrete spectrum. And for instance, if you take uh, new equals one, to put some concrete example, then the values are 3.8, 7.7, 10.8, 10.2, okay? So you find that uh, there is a discrete X spectrum and a mass gap. Okay, so this is how you see a mass gap emerging in the holographic model. Yes. I think like there is the UV-IR connection. If we put a wall in the UV sector, which is like in the interior of the ADS space, we w would expect something to happen in the IR of the CFT. But why did we initially put a, means I thought we, we were trying to generate the mass. Here we have put something by hand and then saying there is a gap in the CFT. But I think well, the flow of logic, I'm slightly unclear. The idea here is that uh, the theory with this gap, is with this wall, is not a CFT anymore. So it looks like a CFT for this uh, range of scales, but then something happens and the theory becomes non-conformal and generates a mass gap, and that's why you have this wall. Okay, so that will be the picture. Yeah, so, so well, from this, it is clear that a, a, a CFT-like theory with a mass gap would be dual to something like this in the geometry. Yeah. But uh, is that what we were trying to get, or were we trying to show that there will be a gap in a particular quantum theory, like QCD or something like that? What, what, was the what we're trying to show is how you can find a holographic model that has a mass gap. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So I see. Okay. Just, well, just to, yeah. to make sure, so uh, the wall there is yeah. not uh, a modification of the geometry. It's just a place where we put boundary conditions. Or yeah, if you want, you cut the geometry without changing the metric here. So, but the, the space-time continues further after the wall? No, no, you no? cut it, yeah. Ah, and so does it make sense to still impose the norm normalization condition if, uh, if you are carrying the space-time because it, then it becomes compact, right? Yeah, it makes sense because the normal is that the mode is normalizable you made on the asymptotic boundary. Mm -hmm. And if it's not normalizable, then it doesn't have finite energy. So that condition still holds even if you put this wall even if you put that wall, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's like if you put a black hole instead of a wall, mm -hmm. then you, the, you can think of the geometry ending at the black hole horizon. Okay. So you impose boundary conditions at the black hole horizon, which are not exactly these ones, but mm -hmm. you have to impose boundary conditions. And then it's the same. You have the modes of uh, finite energy have to be normalizable at the boundary. So it's, they are not affected by changing the infrared. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I, I guess one of the things he was probably confused is that mm. <clears throat> so now yeah. there's only one solution with quantized uh, modes, but uh, the point is that solution has a, has a, a normalizable component and a non-normalizable component as mm. well. Right. Yeah. Well, these solutions, the ones that correspond to the physical spectrum, are only normalizable. The general solution has both. Yeah. Yeah. There is a question there. Um, so it seems like with this construction, you're, you know, as you said, this, um, this is a holographic uh, model for a non-conformal field theory. It's a, or a field theory that looks conformal f in the UV, but in the IR, it has a mass gap. Um, I'm just curious if there's evidence, like, I imagine that you're going to do a lot of phenomenological stuff and like do some matching between these equations as you've already done. I'm wondering if there's any like top-down constructions of models like this, say in you know, type two B string theory, like um, stuff like that, or if this is more of a, yeah, more of a phenomenological or bottom-up construction of holography, or if there are explicit top-down constructions of holographic duals like this. 
Yeah, that was my next point. So, oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, as you said, this is a very bottom-up uh, construction. Uh, so, when you uh, want to do something more refined, then uh, you want to find a geometry that uh, somehow ends at some finite value of the radial coordinate instead of going all the way to a Poincare horizon. So the refinements are typically, you can find them in top down, but also you can construct them in bottom up. So the first thing that uh, was done is uh, you make the space and dynamically. That means you find a set of solutions of the Einstein equations with matter that uh, uh, makes uh, this hard wall appear in a dynamical way. And typically what happens is that uh, a cycle in the internal space collapses to zero size. So uh, I will make a more explicit example of this. And then the other way to do this is uh, that the space, uh, the geometry is modified here in such a way that at some point there is a singularity. Okay, and then you cannot continue beyond this singularity. And finite. And then you relate this to the R gap. Okay, in principle, uh, sometimes these two things are related in the sense that uh, you can find, for instance, a five-dimensional solution of the supergravity equations, which is singular and has this uh, kind of behavior. And then you uplift to higher dimensions, to 10 or 11, and then you find that the solution is smooth, but there is a cycle that is collapsing. And that's why the geometry looks singular in the lower dimensional reduced theory. Okay? So sometimes uh, something that is singular is actually of this kind. Depending on the number of dimensions, you are looking at the solution. Okay, so I'm going to avoid that. Okay, so let's make a concrete example of the first type. which is the first example of, uh, actually, even beyond the hard wall that I described, of a theory which is, uh, has a mass gap. So this is the so-called uh, witten Jan mills model. Okay, so this is a top-down construction. The idea is that uh, you start with uh, NCD4 brains. Okay, so the low energy theory that lives on these D4 brains is uh, a five-dimensional super Jan Mills theory. And then you compactify one direction in these uh, different brains and impose some boundary conditions for fermions that break uh, supersymmetry. So you compactify on a circle with uh, supersymmetric breaking conditions.
Okay. So now, just to let's do this table that we will use for other examples as well. So these are the ten space-time directions in type 2A theory, right? The D4 brain is uh, extended in five of these directions, so four space and one time direction. And then we're taking the fourth direction to be uh, a circle. Okay, so this D4 is wrapping this circle, and then we impose the anti-periodic boundary conditions here. Uh, so there is a Kalusa Klein mass scale, MKK, which is related to the radius of the this fourth direction that the differ is wrapping. Okay, so then the fermions in this five-dimensional supergeometry theory acquire a mass proportional to this kalusa Klein mass because of the boundary conditions, of the periodicity conditions you're imposing on in, the, in this direction. And then the bosons, the scalars, also acquire a mass through uh, loop corrections, okay, because supersymmetry is broken. So then in the infrared, uh, this theory flows to Jan Mills in 4D. Okay. And the scale of this, uh, this theory is confining with a mass gap, which is uh, related to this kalusa Klein mass in this way. Okay, so this is uh, the number of different brains, the number of colors, if you want. The top coupling, some constant that comes from the beta function. And this is evaluated on the kalos mass. And the relation between uh, the coupling constant in four dimensions and the one in uh, five is that... Uh, the four-dimensional dimensionless coupling constant is equal to the radius over the five-dimensional Jamil's coupling constant, which is dimension four. Now, so the point of writing this is that uh, you see that uh, if we flow in the infrared to a theory where at the scale of the kalusa Klein mass we are at weak coupling, then uh, there is a large separation between the scale of the Jan Mills theory in four dimensions and the kalusa Klein mass scale. So if this coupling It's small. It doesn't have to be too small because, uh, well, we have an NC factor here, which is large. Then uh, lambda Jan Mills is much smaller than the Kalosa Klein mass. Okay, so, so this means that if you are below this Kalosa Klein mass scale, then you really are in that four-dimensional Jan Mills theory, uh, effectively. Okay, when we do the holographic model, uh, we are going to do classical gravity without the stringy corrections and so on. So that means we are all going to be at... Maybe uh, put it here. In the holographic model.
we're going to take the un this coupling to be very large, and then this Jan Mills scale is of the order of the calorie climb mass scale. So this means that in the holographic model, there is no separation of scales between uh, the physics of the confining Jan Mills theory and the calorie climb modes. Okay, but still, uh, you can try to. Uh, you know, learn some uh, uh, properties of the confining theory from the holographic model, taking into account that uh, you cannot really decouple from the five-dimensional theory. Okay, so this is just a remark. Okay, so the dual geometry to this uh, D4 brain configuration is given by the following metric. Yeah. How the calusa grain mass appear in the, let's say, 4D Lagrangian, or, uh, yeah, 4D Lagrangian, in, after doing this compact calusa grain compactification? Yeah, so when you do the calusa grain compactification, there will be, uh, there will be modes of the gauge field, of the five-dimensional gauge field, that don't depend on the internal direction. Yes. So these are massless in four dimensions. Okay. And then the rest of the fields will have a dependence on the internal directions. And when you reduce, they become massive modes in four dimensions uh -huh. with a mass which is proportional to the calusa clan mass scale. Okay. No? So end up you end up with uh, infinite towers of massive yes. fields in four dimensions. Yes. OK. Oh, thank yes. you. Uh, this uh, four is uh, is it uh, you have constructed S one from radial coordinate or one of a spatial coordinate? This co compactification direction. I'm compactifying only this fourth direction. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, this is some angular coordinate, right? Is what? Uh, this is some angular coordinate, right? Angular? No, uh, no, no. It's like uh, the geometry here is like r uh, one comma eight times S one. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So the D4 brain is wrapping this S1 and extended in uh, three space directions here. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the holographic dual. is a metric uh, that in the string frame looks like this. So this is um, u over r over to the three halves. Then there are these directions. Then there is the this part and this guy. Okay. Where this F of U. And the dilaton is non trivial. Okay. And there is also some four form flux. Okay, so this is the the metric. So we have uh, here the for uh, the directions along the 
four dimensional field theory. So this will be the zero, one, two, three directions. This will be the four direction where the default brain was wrapped, that I'm calling tau in this metric. And this uh, uh, are the directions transverse to the default brains. Okay, so you split them in a radial direction and a four a sphere, which is surrounding the default brains. No? So when you do the holographic duality, the usual thing happens that you don't have brains anymore, and then this uh, sphere that was surrounding the default brains becomes a uh, four sphere, which is topologically non-trivial. No? It doesn't contract to zero size. Now, this U then is the holographic radial coordinate in this uh, metric, and the ultraviolet is at U equals to infinity. So the UV of the QFT is when U goes to infinity. And R is uh, analogous to the radius of anti uh, sitter in this geometry. So the value of the parameters uh, Uh, let me write them here. Yeah. I'm sorry, just a question for hmm. someone who doesn't know a lot about string theory. Um, yeah. Where, do, why is this called the string frame? What's the, what's the relevance to this? I'm assuming it has some relevance in string theory, but. Just the name string frame, why, where does that yeah. come from? So when you write the action for the metric, the Einstein action, it can be the usual Einstein action where you just have the Ricci scalar, okay. or you can have a factor which uh, depends on this uh, dilaton. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when there is no factor of the dilaton, it's called the Einstein frame. Okay. And then for some particular choice of this factor, it's called the string frame. Okay. So when you look at uh, strings, they couple to the string frame metric. They couple to the, uh, the Nambu Goto action that you write is in the string frame metric. Would you write the usual DBI action for the brains? It's also in the string frame metric. Okay, thank you. Okay. There is no place here. So R cube equals pi G S N C L S cube. This is the string length and the string coupling. And then uh, this tau has a periodicity uh, that is given by the calus climb mass. And the calus climb mass is given by three halves UKK one half over R to the three halves. Uh, okay, so this formula can be derived um, in a similar way as you derive the relation between the Euclidean time periodicity and the position where the uh, black body factor is going to zero. Okay, so I think you did that, so I leave it as an exercise to de derive this. And then uh, these are related to uh, field theory quantities as follows. And then And finally, okay, so there is some holographic dictionary, which is a bit more complicated than the usual one of n equals four, but looks like this. 
Okay, so let's discuss this metric a, a bit more. Now, uh, you see that uh, in this uh, fourth direction, there is this factor here, f of u. And this factor is going to zero when this u reaches this value, u k k. Okay, so that means that you can think of this as the radius of this direction, which is compact. And this direction is going to zero size. And then we do this in a way that uh, the geometry is smooth. Okay, so this condition of the metric being smooth is what gives the relation between the periodicity of tau and the Kaluza Klein mass. So people usually plot this geometry in this way. This will be the u direction. This corresponds to u k k, and this direction. This circle is the tau direction. And so this is called the cigar geometry. OK, so this is similar to the hard wall in a qualitative way, no? because uh, we find that uh, the geometry is ending at this value of uh, the radial coordinate, where this circle has collapsed to zero size. No? We cannot continue the geometry beyond this value. So now, if you do a calculation similar to the one we did in the hard wall, you now, instead of imposing a there is that boundary condition, you have to impose that the solutions are regular here. Then uh, you have that condition plus the condition that is normalizable that gives a discrete spectrum. Okay. So this theory has a mass gap in the same way as the hard wall model does. Okay. Yes. Is it just a coincidence that it very looks like a Euclidean black hole, or there is something profound behind it? Uh, well, you can find this by analytic continuation of the black hole. Yeah. So you just if you do, or you can go back to the black hole by doing the analytic continuation. If you do a weak rotation in this tau direction and here in the time direction, you end up with a black hole geometry. No. Yeah. No, it's non supersymmetric. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. This is epsilon four. This is the volume of the the volume form of this four. Okay, so uh, this has a mass gap because the geometry ends at u equals u k k. Okay, so now that we have this property of uh, having a mass gap, we are going to show that this is a confining geometry as well. Okay, so in principle, mass gap and confinement are not don't have to be the same thing. No? A clear example of this is the standard model. In the standard model, fermions acquire a mass because they are coupled to the Higgs field. So if you have a Higgsing, that produces a mass gap as well. But the theory is not confining. So in order to know whether this uh, kind of mass gap is generated by confinement or by some other mechanism, we have to examine uh, some observable which is sensitive to confinement. Okay, so this is, uh, for instance, the quark antiquark potential can give you a criterion for confinement. Okay, so, so there is no agreement of what is the right definition for confinement. But let's say a working uh, definition is that uh, if we look at the quark at the quark potential, okay. 
then if we had a, if the theory was in a Coulomb phase, then we will have our positive charge and negative charge, and then there will be flux lines, the electric field lines coming out from these charges or ending on these charges. And there will be some kind of dipolar field, no? like this. When there is confinement, uh, what happens is that uh, the gluons attract each other, if you want. So they want to be as close together as possible. And then instead of having this uh, picture, what happens is that there is a flux tube between the charges. Okay, so all the lines, all these uh, flux lines are close together and along some kind of tube. Okay, so then if you try to separate uh, these two charges, then uh, here you have an energy density, right, of, because of this flux, and then you increase the size of the flux, so the energy is going to increase with the distance. Okay, so you find that uh, the quark and the quark potential as a function of the separation L is, grow, is going to grow linearly with some factor sigma. Okay, and that is analogous to what happens in a superconductor. Okay, in a superconductor, what happens is that uh, you have the Meissner effect, no? and if this were monopole, magnetic monopole charges, then the magnetic field lines will be grouped in a flux tube. Okay, so the superconductor repels the magnetic flux and then makes all the flux lines to be grouped uh, in some tube. So the confining phase, if you want, is some kind of dual superconductor where the electric flux lines are confined in this way. So then, uh, so this linear potential has this form for lengths much larger than this scale, and this sigma is proportional to this scale. And it's called the string tensor. Okay, so a way to find this quark and quark potential is through the calculation of the expectation value of a Wilson line. Okay, so we define a Wilson line. What? The sigma, I mean the string there is not the string string. It's this tube between the... This flux tube, uh, it's like, like a, yeah, yeah, yeah. it looks like a string in some sense. But it's not a, you know, a string of a string theory. <laughs> no. But this is called a string tension, nevertheless. Okay, so the Wilson line is defined on some curve. See, it's defined as the trace of the exponential of the integral of the allonomy along the curve, right? So this will be the gauge field of the dual field theory. 
and uh, you can think of uh, this as having a, a charge which has infinite mass and is uh, moving along this curve. Okay? So it's like an infinitely massive charged particle. Now, for the calculation of the quark antiquark potential, one considers a temporal Wilson loop. So the curve is like a rectangle. And then this is along some space direction with some separation L. And this is along the time direction with some time extension delta t. And then when you make this time extension very large, the expectation value of this Wilson line goes like e to the minus delta t, the quark anti quark potential as a function of the separation L. Okay, so you, no, you see that if you send this delta t to infinity, essentially you have a quark here with infinite mass and an anti quark here with infinite mass. So you are just computing the, the potential between these two objects. Now, in this case where uh, if we have confinement in the sense that the quark anti quark potential grows linearly with the separation, then this means that this is proportional to the area in this, uh, inside this curve. So this is the area law for the Wilson loop. Okay. If you have dynamical quarks, then what happens is that at some point, if you separate this uh, a large enough distance, it becomes favorable to create a quark antiquark pair that breaks the string. Okay, and then you end up with two separated strings. So at some point, if you have dynamical quarks, this behavior is no longer true. So that's why you can you cannot use this criterion for QCD because there you have dynamical quarks. Okay, but since we don't have quarks in our holographic construction and everything we will do later, we will neglect the the back reaction of the flavors on the gluons, then we can use this criterion without uh, issues. Okay, so now we need to compute this uh, expectation value of the Wilson line and extract uh, this quark anti quark potential. And the way to do this in holography is through a calculation of the dual of this Wilson line, which is a fundamental string that ends on the same curve where the Wilson line is localized. So let me make a picture. Yeah. Uh, why is it that we have to consider the limit of large delta t in order to do that identification? Well, what happens is uh, here you have a contribution of all kind of states, and then when you take delta t to infinity, only the lowest energy state contributes, and that corresponds to the static quark uh, quark potential. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so the holographic dual of This Wilson line is uh, you take uh, the asymptotic boundary. So here you have the your quantum field theory, and then you have uh, the curve that defines the Wilson line, and then you attach to it some string. Okay, so you, in principle, you need to consider all possible string configurations. But in the larger limit, strong coupling limit that we are using, 
then the main contribution to the expectation value is just coming from whatever classical solution with these boundary conditions you find. Okay, so this you can approximate by a saddle point the expectation value. So this is just proportional to E minus the action of the string. The on cell action. Okay. So let's do this uh, in our setup. I think you did for uh, n equals four, no? So for a CFT, one finds that the potential goes like one over L. And then in our case, uh, what happens is uh, the following. We are going to okay, take um, the action for the string is one over two pi alpha prime the integral of the determinant of the induced metric. So I'm going to do this in Euclidean. So the induced metric is uh, given by the background metric and derivatives of the embedding functions where G and N is the background. X and are the embedding functions. And sigma are the uh, word volume coordinates, or world seed coordinates. Okay, so A is just one, two, one, zero, one. Okay, so this is just the Nambugoto action for the Euclidean signature. And this is the induced metric. Uh, so let me just give you the result, maybe. The embedding we choose is that uh, x0 is sigma 1. We can call this the time direction. Then x1 is uh, the xu will be sigma 2. That's the radial direction. And then x1 is going to be a function of u. And the other x2, x3, and so on are just constants. Okay, so this will be the embedding functions. And then if you plot the x direction and the u direction, then the stream profile is going to be like uh, something like this. So these are this is the L direction, and here is uh, the time direction, if you want. So we have the quark, anti-quark at the boundary. 
separated a distance L, and then the string works it, uh, has to end on these two lines at the boundary. But uh, the string cannot end anywhere else in the interior, so it has to connect. Okay, so the wall seat will be like a half a cylinder attached to the boundary. Okay, this will be the profile for the string. So then, what happens when you start separating these two? endpoints. So what happens is that uh, this geometry is ending at some value of the radial coordinate. Okay, so if, if you separate these two endpoints a very long distance, it, well, first, if they are close together, then this is going to look like uh, a small string attached to the boundary in this way. As you start separating the endpoints, then the string goes deep, deeper down. The same happens in uh, AVS, for instance. But at some point, uh, space ends. So if you separate this a really long distance, then the string goes down as much as it can. But then it has to stay at the bottom of the geometry. Okay, so then there is some contribution to the energy coming from these endpoints, but at some point the contribution here, where there is, there is a finite string tension, becomes dominant, no? and then it grows linearly with the separation. Okay, so then you find that indeed in this geometry. Uh, the, Wilson the Wilson line will have an area law. Okay, it's just here, this just behaves like a normal string which is stretched in this horizontal direction. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear. Sorry, I still didn't hear. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, in the second configuration, there are like three uh, strings. So which uh, string we should uh, choose for the calculation of Wilson loop? Yeah. So there this one. is given by the separation at the boundary. Uh, okay. No? So if for a given separation, you find a profile for the string. Yeah. That is what determines the boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. So if the separation is small, you have something like this. If it's larger, something like that. And if it's very large compared to the Kalosa climb mass scale, okay. then the string looks like this thing here. So we have to consider all three possible uh, configurations here. So, well, if you want to compute what happens at long distances, yeah. then you just consider this one. Oh, okay. Oh, thank yeah. you. If you want to know what happens at short distance, you also have to consider this one. Okay. Yeah. You said that uh, confinement and mass gap are in general different, but here it seems like it's a universal feature of holography, right? That uh, if you have, if space ends at some um, R gap, then if the um, quarks are far enough apart, then the action is bounded by a configuration like this. Yeah, but uh, in this case, that's true. If you have something like a singular geometry, then it's not so clear what the behavior of the string is going to be. Then you need to do the calculation. And then also, for instance, if you now think about, um, if you have a confining theory, then what should happen also is that uh, the magnetic charges are screened, not confined. Okay, and in that case, the geometry is still the same, but because the, the dual to the magnetic uh, uh, Wilson line, the top loop, is a D1 brain, the D1 brain has an additional coupling to the dilaton, and that changes the, 
the tension of the D1 at the bottom. Okay. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, because um, once you reach uh, a length that is long enough for the string to have reached the bottom, when you keep separating these endpoints, uh, what happens is just uh, this part is more or less the same always. But what happens is that this part of the string, which is at the bottom, becomes longer. And because the string at the bottom has a finite string tension, then the energy is increasing linearly with the distance. No. Yes. So maybe it's a bit too early to ask this question, but um, how would you recover the fact? So it seems to me that uh, as long as you have this uh, hard wall cut off, basically there is only a confining phase. There, there are no like multiple phases of uh, QCD. Uh, how do you recover, for instance, that? Uh, at fine, you know, at a temperature high enough, you don't have confinement anymore. Yeah, that was the next point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for the question. So, so what happens is that the geometry changes essentially. But uh, in short. Okay, so let me just do this briefly. How we see that there is the confinement. Now, the, with the boundary conditions that we are imposing, there are two types of solutions. So one of them is the one I wrote before, and the other one is a black brain solution. Okay, so in the Euclidean, we can write the solutions like uh, this. So this will be the Euclidean time. These are the space directions in the field theory. And this is the rest of the metric. Okay, so there are two solutions with same asymptotics. Well, there are actually three, but we can ignore the third one. So the first one is the one we already saw, where Ft is 1, and if u equals F tau, well, 1 minus u k k u over u cube. And the other is the F tau is equal to 1. And if u equals ft equals 1 minus u h cube over u cube. So this is the <laughs> confining solution. And this is the Euclidean black brain solution. Okay. So what happens if uh, in the black brain we have a horizon at uh, u equals u h. So what happens is we can have a configuration where the string 
uh, becomes disconnected and just falls straight into the horizon. Right? So if these two endpoints are close together, we have a connected configuration like we had before. But here, if the stream becomes uh, reaches some point, then it just becomes favorable to break in this way and become disconnected. Okay, so this means that if you keep separating these two parts of the string, the energy is not going to change because the profile of the strings is the same. So this means that uh, VQ Q bar becomes constant when L is much larger than 1 over the temperature. And then uh, this means there is a screening. No? So that corresponds to the, a deconfined phase. It's like a quark-luon plasma in some sense. So we have uh, these two situations. We have this, the confining solution, where we just saw that there is an area law for the potential. And then there is this other case, where we have a black brain. The string can fall into the horizon. And then there is a screening, and that means that this is deconfined. Now, whether we are in the confining phase or in the deconfined phase depends on uh, which, ax which geometry becomes dominant, right? So if we compute uh, uh, the partition function of the dual field theory that maps to the partition function in the gravity side, in this uh, limit that we are taking of classical gravity and so on, the partition function is dominated by saddle points that are uh, given by uh, the sum of classical solutions. <coughs> of the gravity action. OK, so in the large and limit uh, and strong coupling, uh, the partition function is approximated by a sum over saddle points. And then which saddle point becomes dominant? Uh, is the one with the lowest axon, right? So we need to compute the axon for this uh, for these geometries and compare them in order to see which one is dominant. Now, I actually don't have time to do this, but I can give you maybe the the result. Um, well, I can sketch how you will do this. So the classical on cell action You can relate it to uh, the free energy. Of the QFT. OK. It's clear, no, by this relation between the partition function and this uh, quantity. So if you are able to compute the free energy of the QFT from the gravity side, uh, and compare the free energies, then you are able to decide which geometry is dominant. And this you can do in the black brain, just using thermodynamics, and the fact that you can extract the entropy and the temperature from the horizon. OK, so if you compute uh, the entropy, uh, let me do it here. Mm 
the entropy density will be the area of the black hole divided by four times the 10 dimensional Newton constant in the Einstein frame. Okay, so that's relevant. And then uh, the temperature, no, we, we can extract as the Hawking temperature. Okay, so if you do this exercise, you find that the entropy density in terms of the temperature is some constant times uh, the four-dimensional radius t to the five. Okay, and then you can use the first law of thermodynamics to find the energy density integrating with respect to the temperature. And then you can use uh, that the free energy is the energy density minus T times the entropy. And then you find that the free energy is minus one over six, this constant R to the four, T to the six. Okay. Just uh, you extract the Hawking temperature as usual. You compute the entropy, and then using the thermodynamic relations, you get for to this result for the free energy. Now, the confining solution can be obtained by analytic continuation of the black hole. So you can just uh, use this result, exchanging the temperature by the calvin klein mass scale over 2 pi, and exchanging the radius of the fourth direction by the radius of the time direction, which is uh, 1 over the temperature, or beta. So this means that uh, the free energy of the confining solution is minus 1 over 6 constant. The uh, beta, this will be the radius, the radius of the Euclidean direction, and then mkk over 2 pi square, s6 to the 6. Okay, so in terms of this, uh, you can compare now the free energies, and then what you see is that uh, Essentially, it depends on the size of the internal direction, of the direction that is uh, compactified. So what you find is the following. Uh, you have the time direction, and then you have the fourth direction. And then this is the... topology of the black brain in the Euclidean. And this is the topology of the confining solution in the Euclidean. OK, so this has a radius beta. And tau has a radius R4. So the dominant solution is the one. Uh, so this solution is dominant when this radius is smaller. So this corresponds to beta smaller than R to the fourth. And then this solution is dominant where R4 is smaller. Okay? So So if you fix this radius, R4, which is fixed in the calvin sackler mass scale, then if the temperature is small, this beta is large, and then you are in the confining phase. As you increase uh, the temperature, beta becomes smaller, and at some point it's smaller than R4, and then this becomes the dominant solution. So then 
you go from this geometry to this geometry. And the energy jumps, the entropy jumps, no? because the entropy in this case is zero, and the entropy here is non-zero. So this is a first order phase transition. So, okay, so this is, uh, let's say this model is able to capture the confining phase, the deconfined phase, and also the phase transition between the two phases. Um, I think we should stop here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any questions? What are the two diagrams you're drawing? Is one Euclidean and one Lorentzian or something? Both are Euclidean, but these are the two types of solutions yeah, I, but I have here. Uh, two types. Yes, so yeah, yeah. confining but that's a like black brain. These two, means I, I'm asking about the two diagrams on the left side itself. What are those two? So this the is first? the time direction, Yeah. and this is the radial direction. Mm -hmm. So this. Part of the geometry looks like a cigar yeah. in the black brain. Yeah. And then this is the fourth tau direction. Oh. And this is the real direction, and it looks like a cylinder because this circle doesn't collapse the zero size. I see, I see. So these are just two. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, that so is, there is a change in topology. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. The surface that you put at infinity. In order to attach this uh, string that explores the, the, the bulk, uh, it is at infinity, right? Yes, the asymptotic boundary. Uh -huh. yeah. So in, in principle, the, the, this uh, potential between quark and quark should be uh, infinite, because it's at infinite distance, the, or it's a finite? Uh, no, it's uh, just it's uh, the curve that defines the Wilson line is defined at the asymptotic boundary. Uh -huh. And then you have to impose that the string asymptotically goes to this curve. So you have to regularize that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the on shell action should be infinite. I, I ah, yes, yes. You, I don't want to enter into this, but you can add counter terms to the string action to make it finite. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So what what kind of counter terms do you should add? add uh, so for this case. Uh, you just need to add uh, something which is uh, linear in the radial coordinate asymptotically. So if you put a cutoff, okay. it will just be proportional to the radial value of the cutoff. Okay. okay. So it's like if you want the boundary metric of the string. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. So you briefly mentioned that there would be a third possible solution, and so in the diagnostics of uh, how a theory looks like through Wilson, so through the calculation of expectation value of Wilson loops, uh, the third possibility would be to get some sort of scale invariant laws and have a free theory. And is that the case uh, with the third well, thing that you were mentioning? No, I was talking about this. You can have a solution where these two factors are one, okay. but that always has uh, a higher action. So it's never dominant. That's why I didn't discuss it. But, uh, okay. yeah. Do we need to worry about strings ending on the internal space as well? Ending what? On the internal side. And there's an internal S4 here, right? Yeah, you have to specify where on the S4 the string is located. But the action of the string doesn't depend on this. So it can end. It can be located at any point on the S4. Right. So it's like uh, okay. when you did the calculation in AVS5 cross S5, mm. the action doesn't depend on where on the S5 the sure. string is. But yeah. in that case, you end up with like, you have to consider like supersymmetric Wilson loops, no? Yeah. Here because of the strings ending on the internal space. Well, ending. They don't end on the internal space. They're just they, localized they, they at some point. Yeah, sure. On the internal space. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's 
non-trivial flux on the S4, so you need strings on it. Non-trivial flux? Uh, what do you mean? So in the full solution you wrote down, there was a, there's a four-form flux on the... Yeah, but the string doesn't couple to Ramon Ramon. But do you not need something to support the flux on the internal space? What's that? Do you not need some stringy object to support the flux on the internal space? So you could have the brains that couple to this flux? Okay. Like uh, through the Western Minot? Sure, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Necessary to end the geometry either at our gap or at our U UK, UKK or at the horizon to have a mass gap? Uh, well, in the case of the black hole, there is no mass gap. It's just uh, if you look at the spectrum, it is continuous because the, in the Euclidean, it looks like you are ending the geometry, but really what you have is a horizon. But you could, as I said before, you can have. Well, you can have other geometries which also end at some final of the value of the radial coordinate, but uh, they the are singular. Model is also mass gap, right? Yeah, the with the model has a mass gap. So, so, so yeah, I mean that's always the case that you have to cut it off somehow, right? Yeah. Well, I mean at least all the examples I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean it depends what you mean by cut it. You could have a. Yeah, I mean geometry should end. Yeah. You could have a dilaton that is blowing up, yeah, and then the geometry doesn't end, but you still have a mass gap. Effective geometry. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> oh, because I thought we just needed the scale to have a mass gap. That's why there's a mass gap in the KKSS model or soft world model. Yeah, there is always a scale. Yeah. That's it's put in by hand. The software model is phenomenological and it's put in by hand, so it's not really the same thing. <laughs> All right, there are no more questions. Let's thank Altus again. Okay.